Hey guys, it's Shaylin and I'm here today with another episode of Recent Reads. This is the series where I just talk about the last 10 books that I read and we can see what wisdom there is to gain from that experience. These are books that I read from maybe like early June to early July. I just finished the last one yesterday, so for once I'm actually filming this on time. All right, so the first book that I read was Detransition Baby by Tori Peters. This is a novel about these three main characters. The first main character, Reese, is a trans woman. The second character, Ames, is Reese's ex-partner, who when they were dating, Ames was living as a trans woman, but has since detransitioned. And then the other character is Katrina, Ames' his boss, and they've been sleeping together. Pregnancy occurs! And so then it's like a really weird vibe for Ames because the thought of being a father is like, whoa, like, no, like, weird, you know? He does the queerest thing I've ever heard of, which is be like, do you want to group raise this baby with my ex-girlfriend and even though we've been broken up for years and haven't talked to each other i think that she would be a great mom to group raise this baby with it's i'm laughing because it's literally the most queer person shit of all time tori peters really said i see the queer community i remember when i first read the summary for this book and i do remember thinking the cishets are not ready for this but i was ready for it. The thing I love the most about it is how messy and chaotic and queer it is, but also tender. Like the characters are, they're trying their best and they mess up and they're motivated by love. They all have very different relationships to the concept of womanhood and motherhood, but they're all now drawn together by this potential to raise a child at points did struggle to buy that the characters got themselves into this situation like yes queer people do this kind of stuff and for the record i am queer people roasting myself okay but there were points where i was like the opposite of Occam's razor is happening here. I don't necessarily think the entire concept of the book buckles in under that, but I do think that the way they initially get into this situation, I sometimes found a little hard to buy. But once the plot actually got started and they were actually all involved in this little uh, triangle of parenthood, I didn't have issues buying what was going on. I have two little quibbles. The first is just that all the point of views felt quite similar to be in. All in third person, but the voices really felt the same, and I just felt like they should have been differentiated more considering that these three people have dramatically different backgrounds and life experiences. So I just felt like there would have been more opportunity to differentiate those voices a little bit because these are pr three pretty different people, but they were all three really interesting characters. But I don't think that that interestingness was used to differentiate their voices enough. And the other little quibble I had is it just felt like the characters, really all three of them, spend a lot of time thinking about the socio-political nuances of their decisions. And I get that, especially for these three people and the experiences that they've had, but I sometimes felt like they spent more time explaining the socio-political reasoning behind their actions than their own emotions. I was like, but what do you feel? I love that the book talks a lot about gender. I thought that that was really interesting. I love a gendery book, don't get me wrong. It's not that I didn't want them to think on all these things and all the, gen the gender theory that goes into their decisions, but I kind of wanted more of their emotions as well. So next up, I read Outlawed by Anna North. This book is a alternate reality Western. And so we follow Ada, who is the daughter of a midwife in the town that she lives in. At the beginning of the book, she gets married. A year into her marriage, she still has not been able to conceive. In this world, women who are infertile will basically be shunned from their town. And so through a wild string of events that involves her trying to get pregnant with someone else and then her husband finding out, and then she go joins a nunnery and then she ends up joining this gang called uh, the Hole in the Wall Gang. And the Hole in the Wall Gang is led by this mysterious, poised, idealistic, cool-headed, non-binary outlaw named The Kid, who I first of all have to say, I have never known gender envy more than with this character. First of all, this character doesn't use any pronouns. Like there's a scene where Ada can't really figure out The Kid's gender and ask someone like the kid, he, she, and this other character goes, just the kid. And I was like, this character is doing gender right. At one point the kid was described as wearing like a floral suit. And I was like, 
Your pronouns are just your title and you wear like a floral pattern suit. Ada is basically on a quest to figure out what causes infertility because so many women in this society are facing rejection and punishment for it. It is very flawed and very fun. I had so much fun reading this that in many ways I don't really care about the flaws. If I was ranking this book on my enjoyment, I would give it five star writing. And if I was ranking it based on technical quality, I would rate it three star. So I gave it a four star in Goodreads, but I had so much fun reading this that I truly did not care. Like I actually couldn't put it down. Yes, it was flawed, but I had fun, you know? I really enjoyed and bought Ada's competency. So she is the daughter of a midwife and so she's trained in midwifery and it's the skills that she has learned through learning this practice from her mother that earn her a place in the hole in the wall gang. They're like, why should we keep you here? You know nothing about being an outlaw. And she's like, well, I know all these medical skills. Like I can stitch wounds. I know herbs, etc., etc." And they're like, okay. And I bought her competency. Like I really felt like her knowledge was well utilized. The side characters were pretty weak, except for the kid. The kid was the only, I think, well-developed side character. The rest of the side characters all blended together and I couldn't really distinguish one from the other. There are a lot of characters in the hole in the wall and I could never keep straight in my mind who was who. I also thought it was cool how this is an alternate reality. In many ways, the world isn't really ever explained. You just kind of see the world exist as it is. Things aren't explained. There's never an exposition where it's like, oh, and then the flu happened and then this happened. I didn't need the book to like stop, pause and justify everything. I was fine to just watch it exist. Okay, I quickly want to talk about how this book is marketed because I do think the marketing does a disservice. This is a fun story and I think that that's what it accomplishes. However, this book is marketed as like a queer feminist novel. However, I don't know if it was marketed this way by the publisher or if people are just tagging it that way on Goodreads because it is tagged as like LGBT on Goodreads. I really thought going into it that Ada would have a romance with one of the other women in the hole in the wall or with the kid. There was a point where they started getting close and I was like, not to spoil the book, that's not the case. Literally like everyone else in the hole in the wall is queer. And then Ada, there's like one paragraph where she's like seeing all these gay women around me made me wonder, could I love a woman? And then I was like, nah, I'm straight. I did feel slightly misled and I'm not putting that on the author or the book because it's not the author's, it's not up to the author how the book was marketed, right? But if you're going into this expecting a queer love story in a alternate Wild West context, which was exactly what I wanted and everything that I wanted and truly would have revived me from death, I think. You won't get that. I don't think a book should be tagged as LGBT fiction because there are queer side characters. I think this book is marketed as like a feminist novel and I also wouldn't consider it a feminist novel. Yes, I guess the main characters are like all women or non-binary but again that doesn't make a book a feminist novel in the book you know the kids whole goal is to create basically a safe haven for women who have been outcast by society there isn't really any commentary on that other than just women are treated badly in this society like i don't know i don't think that that again makes it a feminist novel is it a really fun alternate history western novel yeah, I loved reading it. It was so much fun. This is the most fun I've had reading a book in ages. I think it's a fun story and I think that's where it succeeds. So then I picked up Homesick for Another World by Otessa Moshvig. This is Otessa Moshvig's collection and it was my last Otessa Moshvig novel. Or it's not a novel, my last Otessa Moshvig book. You guys know I love Otessa Moshvig. I would die for Otessa Moshvig. I just think she's great. Um, Eileen and My Year of Rest and Relaxation are both among my favorite novels. Most of the stories in this collection focus on strange, uncomfortable attraction. So characters having attraction that feels perverse or uncomfortable. I saw a quote from Otessa Moshvig where she talks about how fiction should be able to exist in an amoral universe. She's very good at what she does because she runs with that. Her characters are, immor are immoral, their situations are immoral, and that's what makes her work so interesting. She has this gift for making you invest in the most gross, unsightly people and situations <laughs> by just leaning into it so much. There's no beauty in these stories. They're disgusting and the people are perverse and they do things that you don't want to think about people do. But you do read about it and it works because she leans into it so much. Pretty much in every story there's a point where you're like, most writers would not go there, but she goes there and it's gross. But that fearlessness I think makes the stories 
effective. So then I read The White Book by Han Kang. Um, I really enjoy some of Han Kang's other work, like The Vegetarian, I love, it's so freaky. I don't know if this is fiction or nonfiction, to be honest. I don't know if the narrator is Han Kang or if the narrator is a fictional character, I'm not really sure. Um, so I'm just gonna call this a meditation on grief. The speaker reflecting on her older sister who died like hours after being born. So her mother's first child, but she's able to talk about how this grief has shaped her life. And, you know, thinking about like how, how can you grieve someone who, if they had lived, you never would have been born. There's a, a middle section of the book, which is just an imagining of this character's life intersecting with the speaker's lives and how their life may have unfolded had they lived and the speaker never been born. And all of this is done through the central metaphor of the color white. And it's like, why are people drawn to white things? Why do we associate the color white with things like innocence or purity? And that's like the vehicle to talk about grief. There's some photography in here. Most of the chapters are very short and they're all named after a white thing. This is one of the most powerful pieces of literature I'd read in a long time. I read this in one sitting and all I can say is, ouch. <laughs> the imagery is really honed and gorgeous, almost like in a poem. The imagery is distilled and exists as a, a single image that does something powerful rather than within the context of a larger scene. It would have been so easy for a novel about grief, which is an emotion that is so complicated, but one that's been written about a lot, to feel melodramatic when it's told in such little standalone vignettes, but instead it felt powerful and original and complex. I pictured the whole thing in black and white, which was really cool, maybe because the, the photos are in black and white. It's a heavy read, obviously, because of the subject matter, but it's like stunningly done. Like, it's definitely my favorite of Hong Kang's novels. It's somewhere between novel, essay collection, memoir, and poem, I feel. It's beautiful. So then I read Territory of Light by Yuko Tsushima. This is a novella. This book follows a woman whose husband has just left her and she has a young daughter. It follows her a y over a year of her life as she moves into a new apartment in Tokyo. I don't have much to say about this novella, to be honest. My main praise for it is that it is a very delicate softness to it, which I think is quite lovely. The whole thing is like a curtain wafting in a spring breeze, you know? Um, just beautiful, fragile kind of feeling to this, but I found it very hard to stay engaged with the plot. I don't know if it was the pacing, nothing really occurs. And normally I don't mind books where nothing really happens, but for some reason I just couldn't really stay engaged with this one. I read this in just one day and I don't really remember my thoughts about it too well. There are qualities of it to admire, but for me personally, I just didn't really feel that engaged with the story. So then I read Astra by Cedar Bowers. This is a new release. And um, if any of you guys have read Greenwood by Michael Christie, uh, Cedar Bowers is actually Michael Christie's wife. So anyways, I just think that that's adorable. So this book follows a woman named Astra who is born and raised on a remote commune in BC. And the book is told basically through the eyes of everyone who meets her throughout her life. So every chapter follows a different character, but explores their relationship with Astra. I thought it was really well structured and uh, interesting how the book dips in and out of her life and we're able to get a cohesive sense of her growth as a person through these pretty choppy vignettes. All of the characters I thought were very interesting. Um, overall, I think that it, it was a difficult structure to pull off and she did a really good job. Astra as a central character, she's really interesting and she is a character worth following through the eyes of others. With a structure like this, it would be easy to kind of ask yourself, why is this one person so special that we're focusing on them through the eyes of everyone they interact with? It would have been easy for her to feel kind of like a manic pixie dream girl, like, ooh, strange mysterious girl from the commune comes in and changes everyone's life in these brief moments, but it's not it. If anything, we were seeing how people took advantage of her rather than how she changed them. That was actually kind of sad. She was a character that I totally understood why we were following her through the way she affected others. The reason I rated this four stars is honestly just because there wasn't enough like oomph for me to love it. I really enjoyed it. For me to have rated it five stars, I just would have wanted the heat dialed up at points, but overall well conceptualized and well executed. So then we have some poetry, Undoing Hours by Selena Bone. This is Selena Bone's debut collection and I actually first encountered her poetry because I saw her read at a reading 
years ago. And I was so enchanted by her reading. And ever since then, I've been like waiting for her to publish a book. And then she did. I loved it. So I love language. And in this collection, language isn't just a form, it's an aboutness. So much of the book is um, told through the vehicle of her learning Cree. It's interesting. I hate narratives about writing, but I love narratives about language and I love work that is about language and even the process of learning language. These poems use language to be about language, to be about everything else. I found this collection to be tender and striking and careful and intimate and very lyric but never indulgent. The question of each poem is felt as like a part of the poem. The speaker figuring out what she's trying to say and uncovering the poem is part of the poem's forward motion. And I like that a lot more than a poem that's just trying to be like, here I am confidently saying what I know. To me, it's more human for the poem to be, as part of its own motion, figuring out what it's trying to say. And that didn't feel confusing or muddled or unfinished. It was actually like really beautiful. I think it's very hard to write a poem in which part of the poem's movement is the poem examining itself, but she does that throughout and it is beautiful. This is one of my favorite collections that I have ever read. Not all of the poems are about the process of learning Cree, but that process of her learning language is used as form for poems that are about other things, but that also becomes an aboutness. You see language as fully alive in this book. It's amazing. It's amazing. So next up, we have Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. This has been on my TBR for a while. This is a gothic horror novel um, set in the 1950s in Mexico. We follow the main character, Noemi, who goes to go visit her sister Catalina, her husband's family's weird house in this old mining ghost town. Um, like I enjoyed reading it. It's pretty wacky. It gets wild, but I do have a lot of thoughts. The main character, Noemi, like she's an icon and there are a lot of things about her that make her very interesting. She's this like glamorous socialite, but she also like wants to be an anthropologist. So there's a lot of really interesting things about her but I felt like these things were never really utilized. Like she doesn't ever use those skills to figure things out or solve problems. They were just static traits about her. And beyond her, I thought the other side characters were all pretty flat and underdeveloped. Like this book is really interesting and compelling and disturbing, but ultimately a little too blatant in and clumsy in how it handles its information. I think I would have forgiven the messiness more if the characters were more well-developed because then it would have made sense, like people are messy, but the characters were pretty flat. I really wanted Noemi to figure things out more than she was told. There were a lot of points where like, you know, someone is like, and I'll go on for three pages about all the things that are secrets that I'm now telling you. And like, I wanted her to figure that out on her own. Like she is such a smart character or we're told she's a smart character. So I wanted to actually see her being intelligent and solving problems because I know that she has the capacity to do that, but she was rarely given that opportunity. So I overall had pretty mixed feelings on the ending and reveal, but I still rated this like a 3.5 because it was a fun read. Like I really, I did enjoy it. It was fun. I was glad to be along for the ride. And I thought that there were a lot of cool things going on. I guess I just wanted those really cool things to be handled with a bit more nimbleness. So then I read Papisho by Leon Ross. This is like a fantastical novel about a bunch of different characters who live in Papisho, which is like a mythical island or a group of islands based on Jamaica. And everyone in Papisho has a little magic and the magics are all very interesting and unique. One of the main characters, what he can do is that um, he can season food through touch. Like he can add flavor to food through touch, which is really cool. And it's kind of just like a day in Papisho where a lot of wild things happen. <laughs> it's the best I can describe it. I think a lot of this book has a lot of really great qualities. It is magical and fun and enchanting and delightful and full of wonder. The magic is so lovely. Like I would have read hundreds of pages just on lore about this magic. The magical abilities people had were, I don't know, like so original and charming. Where this fell short was that I found the plot essentially incoherent. I felt like there were so many different events and little plot threads and 
nothing was really working together or coherently. Like, I would get to the next scene, we would come back to a character's plot, and I'd be like, I don't even know what's going on with you. Like, you're here, you're wandering around, something is kind of happening, I don't know. I think this would have benefited from maybe... Uh, it's tough to... I don't want to say this would have benefited from a narrow sc scope, because I understand that the vision of this novel is that we're following Papisho, like, as a character in itself, which means following a wider breadth of characters. But I don't know, I just found the plot development to be much less interesting than the world itself. I had more fun exploring the world than I did following the characters through a developing storyline. So it's the last book of this video, The Prettiest Star by Carter Sickles. So this is a novel about the AIDS crisis, so going in, I knew it would hurt. This book follows Brian and his family. Years before the book starts, Brian moved to New York away from his small Appalachian town. And so he goes to New York, he has a great time, he falls in love, and then his friends start dying of AIDS and he's getting to the point where he is quite ill. And so he goes back to stay with his family in his hometown when he hasn't seen them for years. Oh my God, this book, it just, it really hurts. <laughs> Part of it is that the characters are all so human and tender and honest. So we mainly follow three characters. We follow Brian and his chapters are told through video logs because he's a videographer and so he takes video clips of things all the time. And then we also follow his younger sister, Jess, who I think she's like 14. She's obsessed with whales and his mother, Sharon. Sharon, I thought was a feat of characterization. It was very clear that she had so many homophobic ideas that she had to unlearn in order to have a relationship with her son in his last months of life. But I thought that the care given to that character was beautiful. If I would have been writing this book, it would have been easy for me to not give as much empathy to the mother and give all the empathy in my writing to the son. Carter Sickles treated all three of these characters with just as much care and all the characters around them. Can we give a shout out to Letty? the grandma. I love her. Very, very thoughtful character writing. I thought Jess, the sister, was so well written and so accurate to her age. Brian was extremely well written, just very thoughtful characterization. I don't, I can't really say anything coherent because I finished this book yesterday and I'm still in pain. I just, I felt a lot. It's brought out visceral amounts of emotion in me. So yeah, this was really good. <laughs> Like, it was so well written and the character work was so wonderful, but like, make sure you're in the place, the right place when you read it, because it's pretty devastating. That's all I've got for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, I would love to know what you've been reading lately. Your favorite books you've been reading lately or your least favorite books you've been reading lately. I've started asking in these videos, like, to tell me about books you hate because I also want the tea. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you have any questions, you can always send me an ask on Tumblr and I'll see you in another video. Bye.